Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Pastor Rick Ross, and it's just a delight to have you all here this morning. We're going to be beginning our six-week session on faith and civic life. Uh, some of the questions that we're going to be asking ourselves during our time together, how do we faithfully live out our baptismal vocation in everyday life? What does that mean, to faithfully live our baptism as everyday disciples? Now, what does it mean for us to follow Jesus in our citizenship? And finally, uh, why could voting be considered a faith-filled act of justice? So these are just some of the questions that we're going to be thinking about uh, during this course. The course is actually designed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America in order to help us look at the issues of faith and civic life, because the church is currently in the process of finalizing a social statement on faith and civic life. Uh, every so often, uh, the ELCA will put together a social statement on some social issue, uh, and currently they're working on one about our citizenship. What does it mean to be a faithful Christian citizen in this country? And it certainly is a timely topic as we're facing what's called white right Christian nationalism. I'm going to put in a plug right now for uh, Jim Wallace's new book. Uh, several of us just got our copies. Uh, Jim Wallace, as you may know, um, longtime uh, evangelical pastor and founder of Sojourners. He's written a number of books. He's currently at, um, well, it's the uh, Catholic University in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and he's yeah. Georgetown University. Thank you. And he is the executive director of the new Center for Faith and Justice. Anyway, he has a new book out called The False White Gospel. And the subtitle is Rejecting Christian Nationalism, Reclaiming True Faith, and Refounding Democracy. And he's written this uh, for the average layperson. It's not for scholars, although he's a scholar himself, but it's written uh, in a way that you can kind of digest it easily. There's a lot of scripture references. Uh, it's about how do we reclaim the gospel message for our churches today, and also how do we save our democracy. So he's very passionate about it. I've heard him speak. Um, he was current recently on uh, the Joy Reid show, MSNBC. She interviewed him about his new book. And uh, I saw a webinar where he was uh, speaking with a number of his colleagues about the book. He is very passionate about the dangers we're facing right now in our country as uh, uh, both the perils to our democracy, but also the dangers to our Christian witness. And we'll touch on some of that. That's our commercial for today. <laughs> um, I want you to uh, sign up. We have a uh, clipboard going around. There's two of them. So if you make sure we get to each table. The reason I need you to sign up is because I'll be sending out emails to everyone. Uh, and in fact, the ELCA would really appreciate our feedback about this class in particular. So you're going to, weekly, you're going to get a both resources from me on uh, email, but also there'll be a copy of a survey about what you thought about the class. Because they're, they're trying to get, uh, this is a pilot course that we're doing on behalf of the ESCA, and we really are uh, grateful for any feedback. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that the ESCA is also soliciting response to the statement itself. We have a draft statement online, and I'm going to send you that email so you'll have a copy of it. It's a fairly lengthy statement, so I didn't want to run off copies and 
and uh, have to danger a few trees. And so you're going to just have to look at it online. Um, but there is a survey that's actually in the packet. And I'm going to collect these um, towards the end of the course. But uh, if and when you get a chance to look at the survey online, if you would fill this out, and then I'll collect these. And you can turn them in to me anytime. You don't have to wait till the end of the course. But when you, when you uh, look at the survey or the draft statement online, if you could fill this out, and then I'll collect these and send these in in a packet to the ELCA church right offices. Um, we would appreciate very much your feedback on the statement itself. So there's two different surveys. This is for the statement that I'm going to send you, this draft statement of what, of what the uh, church is proposing. It'll be brought to the church-wide assembly summer of 2025, so a year from this coming summer. We'll be voting on the new statement on faith and civic life. The other survey is the weekly survey, just feedback uh, about it, uh, each course, no. each uh, class session. Um, in the package, uh, I want you to, uh, to know that there's a number of great resources for you. There's the the packet, the, your leaders, your your student packet. It'll have the daily, uh, weekly uh, sessions for you. There's a glossary. There's um, a number of, of other materials that I put in there for you. Um, and then, just last thing I wanted to mention is that our method of this course is primarily I'll give a brief lecture. And then we're going to watch a video that has been prepared by the ESCA churchwide to stimulate conversation. And then we'll break for conversation at each table. And I'll have some questions for us to take a look at. But let's uh, turn to the first, uh, this is page two in your packet. Um, after the welcome, there's an opening prayer. And I'd like to have us pray that together. If you can find the opening prayer in your packet. Let us pray. Blessed Trinity, you call your people to responsible citizenship for the sake of your world. Help us to be faithful disciples who care as you do about the common good. We give thanks for the aspirations of this society for democracy and justice for all, even while admitting our fears and acknowledging failures. Be with each of us as together we study these topics relevant to civic life and faith. May our thoughts and words be honest, insightful, and faithful. In all that we say and do, may we strengthen each other as siblings in Christ. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And our scripture for today is from Psalm 133. How wonderful it is, how pleasant for God's people to live together in harmony. Good words. Um, also in your packet, you'll find uh, should be in that first session. It's called uh, Covenant. Find if you can find that. Civic Life and Faith Study Group Covenant. Is it, is it in five sessions? It should be in the, page three. Page three? Okay, that's there you go. It looks like this. Yeah. That's it. It's in your, it's in your student packet. Oh. It's like going back to school, isn't it? <laughs> Are there any extra folders? It's in your students. It's, it's 
the class. This is the cover. Because the guy. And it's name six. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to ask, uh, just so you listen to a different voice, um, Beth, would you come up here and read through this for me? This is our duties as assigned to spouse. This is our commitment, our commitment to one another during these six sessions. Our commitment is to lift up the body of Christ through words and actions that follow the golden rule, do unto others as I expect them to do unto me. Model respectful and careful listening without interrupting. Strive to understand each other's insights and experiences. Speak honestly as an individual rather than for a group. Do not presume that others speak on behalf of a group. Utilize any technology constructively and not as a distraction. Step up to share thoughts, then step back to allow others to share theirs. Be mindful of viewpoints not represented. Fervently seek the Holy Spirit's presence and blessing in the group and in our civic life. Thank you. So this is our covenant together over the next six weeks as we share with one another our thoughts, our concerns, um, and our opinions. I know that this is a safe place for us to do that as we share a table together. Uh, and this is a time for us to be to be honest with each other. And this is a genuine community of faith where we want to be able to uh, share openly with each other. And so I invite you to do so uh, using this covenant as a guideline for our conversation. So I'm going to uh, give you some background this morning, uh, just a brief kind of historical background as we talk about uh, when we talk about civic life and faith, what do we mean? And I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of Christianity. Well, not quite that far, but when Christianity became part of the empire. So this is a, a real quick history lesson. We have the uh, Edict of Milan in 313 when Emperor Constantine, who was the emperor of the Roman Empire, <laughs> said that Christianity now was no longer an outlawed religion, but it was one of many recognized legal religions in the empire. His uh, successor, Theodosius, went a little bit further. In 380, he declared that Christianity was now the official religion of the empire. Now think about that. The official religion of the empire. In other words, that was it. You were all to be Christians now. Um, and this has some implications for today. Uh, and we'll talk about that along the way. But as, as some of our Christian brothers and sisters are saying, Christianity should be the official religion of the United States. And think about what those implications are to say that is the religion. That's the religion. And that's really the only religion that you should have. Anyway. So we suddenly become part of the empire. Christianity is the official religion of the empire. But what happened then in 476 with the fall of the Roman Empire? Now, with the beginning of Christianity being the official religion, we have 
the Pope in Rome now set up to be ruling over the spiritual life of the whole empire. Well, suddenly, with the fall of the empire in 476, and there's no longer an emperor, the popes begin to step into that vacuum and take on not just a spiritual role, but also a temporal role. And we see what the results are. Uh, we move forward into a kind of the medieval period where Pope Urban II calls for a crusade to go to Jerusalem to rout out the Muslims and uh, rallies the troops in Europe from all the countries in Europe to come to his aid and go to the Holy Land. Uh, and we won't go into all the details, but it was not one of the better marks on our Christian faith uh, as the Crusaders went in and they killed and pillaged. Um, following Pope Urban, we have in 1417, we're just going to quickly go through our history here. Pope Martin V mediates the Hundred Years' War between France and England. They'd been at war for a hundred years. But he steps in to mediate. So you can see now how he's the popes are taking on very much a political role. He also then calls for a crusade against the Hussites. But who are the Hussites? Remember John Huss? He was in, uh, in Prague. And he was uh, one of, actually one of Luther's um, heroes. Uh, Luther really admired John Huss because John Huss took on the Pope. He took on uh, the religion, the religious uh, bureaucracy, and uh, he was calling people back to faithfulness, um, faithfulness to the gospel, to Jesus Christ. He thought that the uh, the church had gotten too involved in politics. Um, and in fact, the Pope was very, very, and, and bishops uh, had a very strong political uh, role and power in most of the countries in Europe at the time. Well, he led a crusade against the Hussites to put them down, to crush them, because they were, they were troublemakers. Well, fast forward to 1517, 100 years later. Yeah, you all know about Martin Luther, right? Uh, Pope Leo X uh, was also a very political um, animal of his day. Um, Luther took him on. He took on the Catholic Church with his 95 theses. Uh, and suddenly we have this whole new Protestant movement protesting the Catholic Church, saying the Catholic Church has gone too political, needs to go back to its spiritual roots. And a number of uh, uh, we would call lords or princes of various territories uh, saw Luther as a hero. Why? Because they could, uh, they could get rid of the, uh, the Pope and the Catholic um, domination. They could take, uh, take spiritual control over their people. Um, so we have the Catholic princes and then the Lutheran princes and other Protestants, because Calvin uh, and Zwingli and others followed Luther's example in terms of rallying the, the faithful to oppose um, the Catholic Church at the time, and the Pope in particular. Um, so there was so much turmoil that, and, and also uh, the Catholics were in arms against the, uh, the Protestants, but Emperor Charles decided to uh, try to help matters by proclaiming the Peace of Augsburg, where he said, now, the, let's, 
let's have a peace here and let the Protestants have their territory, let's have the Catholics have their territory. But that was very short-lived because in 1618, uh, the Calvinists were crushed by Catholic forces in Bohemia, today, today would be the Czech Republic, um, and it, it initiated the Thirty Years' War, where we had the Catholics and the Protestants at war with one another. Finally, in 1648, we have the Treaty of Westphalia, which basically said, whatever your prince is, that's going to be your religion. So if you're in a you're in Saxony, uh, Germany, where the prince is Lutheran, you're going to be Lutheran. Um, if you're in another part of Germany or you're in France or wherever, wherever your prince is and he's Catholic, you're going to be Catholic. And of course, in England, um, we know the story there that. What happened in England? <laughs> Henry, actually, and you know, when we went to the Pope initially to try to get a, an annulment from his first wife, Catherine, the Pope wouldn't give it to him. So we went to Martin Luther, it's a true story, and asked Martin Luther for an annulment. Luther wouldn't give it to him either. <laughs> So he said, okay, I'll just declare myself the head of the church in England. And that's how Anglicanism uh, became uh, into being, uh, which is, we consider that part of the Protestant uh, family. Well, you can see, I just wanted to give you a picture of how the, uh, the temporal and the spiritual have been so intermingled in our, in our history as a church. And why, when our founding fathers and mothers came to this country, they were ready to be done with this, uh, this whole thing, where the church was calling the shots or you were being told what religion you could be or couldn't be. And so we have separation of church and state in this country. But Martin Luther kind of anticipated that. And so this leads to Luther's two kingdoms. And you have a, um, you don't need to look it up right now, but I want you to. Uh, to know that you have a little flyer which you can read later about Luther's two kings. I'll just give you a real quick summary. For Luther, uh, this was meant to bring some order out of chaos, the chaos that you just saw on the other sheet, where the two kingdoms, in Luther's view, God reigned over each, but in a different way. In the spiritual kingdom, the kingdom is ruled by Christ. And this is really the realm of the church. In the temporal realm, we have the emperor, we have the governor, we have the temporal rulers that rule in the state. And <clears throat> So while the kingdoms differ, God rules over them for different purposes, but they are to work side by side. You know, they're side by side, but they're not to cross over in Luther's mind. They work to cross over. You see, that's why this barrier is here. We have the spiritual realm, the church, the temporal realm, the state. And they work to cross over into each other's lanes. Before this doctrine, social order was a mess, as we can, we can see on the other side. Princes and priests incessantly got into each other's businesses. Princes ruled over spiritual affairs. Church prelates grabbed civil authority for themselves. 
Um, and mostly it was for power, control, for profit. The two kingdoms that I mentioned were to bring order. And it required that religious leaders were free to attend zealously to the preaching and teaching, to the sacraments, to care for the spiritual needs of the people. But it also required that in the state, in the temple realm, that the prince or other authorities were to work for the common good, to work for the care of the people. Um, civic leaders were responsible for protecting the rest of the civil order, maintaining political freedom, which was necessary for the churches to do their own ministries. Civic authorities were not necessarily required to be Christian, though if it was a preference at the time. Above all, worldly authorities were skilled in administration, prudence, law, political wisdom, in negotiating the competing claims of citizens and others. But again, it was to work for the common good. Now, there's two exceptions to this stay in your lane argument. The first exception was that citizens as a group would advocate change when the political authorities violated the golden rule, that is, when they abused human rights, or when there were people in their realm that were not being cared for or were being persecuted, and the temporal authorities didn't step up to take care of them. They were to, they were to administer the state in a just and compassionate way. And when they were doing that, then the citizens could rise up and those even in the church could hold them to account because all were called to advance the common good. The second exception is also a great and grave Lutheran concern, which is to protect the freedom of the church. Today we say all faith communities and not just our Lutheran community, to proclaim so that we were free to proclaim the gospel and administer the sacrament. And if the state tried to interfere, then not only were the people in the church to stay to step up, but their brothers and sisters in the temporal realm were to come to their aid to make sure that we maintain that freedom to proclaim the gospel and administer the sacraments and to carry out God's work. Any questions about Luther's two kingdoms? Make sense? Yeah, there is a problem that most many scholars, scriptures would say that Luther did not duplicate Paul's king, kingdom. Paul has two kingdoms. Many would say Luther had three kingdoms. And the problem is, is that uh, Luther was really maintaining, in my perspective, the agreement that occurred at the time the church was declared the official religion of the empire. Namely, unlike the early Christians who were concerned about what's happening on earth, the church was told, you take care of the spiritual matters, we'll take care of civic politics. Right. But that's a, a really a distortion of what the early Judean Christians understood to be their responsibility. So it attempted to avoid conflict, but the question is, can the church really avoid conflict with a state that's simply primarily concerned about its own people and not people living elsewhere in the world? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The other piece of this is that, and I think it maybe uh, refers back to what you're saying, is that Christians were obviously living in both realms. You know, we have a foot in both places, don't we? We're in the spiritual realm, we're also in the temporal realm. And you have to recognize what you're calling us, what God is calling you to be and to do. So living in the temporal realm, if you have a, a gift for administration, um, 
if you have a passion to serve in government, you are to do so. That's where God is calling you uh, to serve your vocation. It's also where you are to work for things like peace and justice. Uh, in fact, that's part of our baptismal calling uh, to work for peace and justice. So a Christian is working um, in both realms following God's call to do what they feel God is calling them to do. But again, it's always for the common good. We're going to look at a film now uh, that's been put together for this session. We're going to come back and we're going to have some conversation at tables. God's peace to you, and welcome to the study curriculum on civic life and faith being used across the ELCA. I'm the Reverend Dr. Roger Willer, director of the ELCA process that's bringing you this six-session exploration. Now, you may think it's great, or you may think it's a big mistake to be talking about the relationship of Christian faith to civic life, about politics and the church. The thing is, from the very earliest days, followers of Jesus have had to work out faith's relationship to power, to politics, and to government. We have many examples of this in Scripture. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus redirects the trick question about paying taxes by simply acknowledging that there is a foreign conquering government. In the letter to the Romans, St. Paul affirms the Roman government insofar as it is God's servant for your good. But in Revelations, that same government is pronounced a beast. With three different takes on discipleship and government. On one point, however, the scriptures are consistent. God is active in human society, seeking good for all, and calls his people to join in. Micah 6, 8 puts it very clearly. For what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Seeking justice and loving kindness in a holistic way includes some form of being active in civic life. Engaged citizenship is not the only way to love the neighbor, but Scripture makes clear it is an essential part of doing so. In a democracy, it is only through the political activity of the people that many of our neighbor's needs get met or don't. The ELCA Constitution recognizes this it directs our church to, and I quote, work with civil authorities in areas of mutual endeavor, maintaining institutional separation of church and state in a relationship of functional interaction. Institutional separation with functional interaction is part of serving God's mission in this society. For these reasons, the 2019 Churchwide Assembly authorized a brief social message focused on government. That's already done. And it also authorized a social statement addressing all aspects of civic life and faith as a means to, and I quote, probe for shared convictions and establish this church's comprehensive teaching. Since the ELCA develops its social teaching through a democratic participatory process, this study invites you to learn and to contribute to that effort toward comprehensive teaching. In this introductory video, I want to, one, help you understand the fundamental ELCA commitment about being a community of moral deliberation. Two, explain how this study is part of the process leading to a social statement. Three, give you a sneak preview of the other sessions in the study. 
for face honestly why talking about civic life or politics is extremely hard today and finally introduce you to the idea of a conversation covenant in our society one's personal identity is huge huge and whatever you think about finding yourself billion dollar industry that we have it's true that every human is concerned about self identity and it's also true that one's personal political views naturally are part of that identity but while political and other identifications matter the christian faith teaches that our fundamental identity is rooted in god's work and delivered in baptism as you may recall from our baptismal liturgy by water and the word god delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in jesus christ we are united with all the baptized in the one body of christ anointed with the gift of holy spirit and joined in god's mission for the life of the world each person of course has political racial gender sexual ethnic urban rural and a host of other identifications they do matter christ church celebrates identification diversity as a gift from our creator but the identity that gives us unity as christians is god's free gift of mercy that makes us god's forgiven people together and enables us to talk together as christian siblings our unity is not in our ability to find agreement i'll repeat that our unity is not in our ability to have full agreement the idea of being a community of moral deliberation stresses both the nature of the gift of unity and the need to discern together now in our church what we teach about social issues is established in official documents created through a democratic participatory process that process involves lots of time lots of study and lots of people social statements for example are made official by a churchwide assembly held every third year as the primary decision making body of our church every assembly is comprised of voting members from synods across the US the social teaching that they adopt sets forth this church's theological and ethical understanding and establishes policy regarding individual and corporate christian responsibility in the world as i said earlier the current work to create a statement on civic life and faith was initiated by the 2019 assembly now here on the screen you see the individuals on the social statement task force members selected by the ELCA church council it is comprised of rostered leaders and lay people with a wide range of relevant professional and first hand experiences this study curriculum is provided by that task force as one step in the five year process of creating a social statement the study provides for your participation and input directly to the task force you'll find a response form is included for every session allowing you to comment now i'm not going to go into great detail about each of the additional sessions projected on your screen for this study but you can see how it covers a lot of territory practices for addressing controversy lutheran themes for civic life first amendment issues the relationship of faith based living and civic life connections between worship life and serving the neighbor and society yeah that's a lot packed into six sessions but again you're asked to share your feedback to all of it so the task force can hear 
what you have to say as a person of faith. As we explore civic life and faith, one of the first things to face is what we mean by politics. And here we return to the idea of identity. Humans instinctually live with a sense of us versus them. Think about the sports world and the sustained rivalries in which fans identify with their team against all others. It's a matter of group identity and belonging. I live in the Chicago area, so it's the Bears versus the Packers, or the Cubs versus the St. Louis Cardinals. And just like that, our activity in civic life is deeply influenced by group identity. Today, the word politics is often used interchangeably with partisanship. It's used to mean cutthroat, nasty, despicable behavior. But in its original, non-judgmental meaning, politics merely describes a necessary fact of life. There are politics as early as Cain and Abel. The term politics, originating in the Greek, describes the necessary activity of deciding how to govern, how to order life in the community, the polis, for the common good. It is about figuring out who gets what, when, where, and how, so that all may flourish. Politics involves both competition and cooperation. It is the unavoidable art of guiding or influencing government and intended to help lead to good for all. This is how we will use the word throughout this study. That said, we must acknowledge there is a huge social problem, partisan polarization. Yeah, there have always been those who identify as liberal, moderate, or conservative. But now these political commitments often are linked as never before with other identities such as ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, urban, rural, cable news preferences, what restaurant you frequent, and many more. Today, these are what we call mega identities. Loyalty to an interlocking mega identity has become so oversized that it walls people off from others who don't share the same set of beliefs. These mega identities have taken on huge emotional stakes. All I have to do is say gun rights, immigration, Fox News, or MSNBC, and it sparks us versus them. Here's one really striking illustration. In 2010, 49% of Republicans and 33% of Democrats strongly objected to the idea of a child marrying someone from the other party. Whereas in 1960, it was 5%. Fear about who marries whom is now linked to my safety, my identity, what's right, and the threat of them. It's no wonder, then, that talking together, even as Christian siblings, about civic life and faith is scary. In your congregation and mine, many people want to avoid it altogether. Maybe that includes you or those close to you. So let's acknowledge that partisan polarization is real. It affects you and me, and I'm afraid it's here to stay for the foreseeable future. So what do we do as God's people, knowing that God calls us to talk together even when it's challenging? How do we do it? Most fundamentally, we cling to the Christian's core identity. More than anything else, our identity is as God's forgiven people. It is God's gift of unity that empowers us to talk together respectfully. This makes possible charitable listening 
as a witness to God's love, as a model for how people of various perspectives from even polarized views can seek to understand why someone else thinks differently. It's also a witness to God's love, of course, when someone points out claims that, intentionally or not, are demeaning to other people or groups. Charitable listening does not accept attacks against other people, but it does want to listen to why someone else holds a different view. Respectful and charitable listening helps all of us see God's world and each other through God's eyes. Hopefully, there are practices for respecting dialogue and for charitable listening. To that end, this session and the next, one focuses on practices for talking together. For example, at the end of today's session, you will be introduced to and asked to commit to a conversation covenant. There are ways to have holy conversations. But for now, it's time for you to discuss ideas that have caught your attention in this presentation. On behalf of the ELCA Task Force on Civic Life and Faith, I welcome you to this study. I thank you for your participation. God's peace. I'm going to ask you now to, uh, before we stop and uh, have some conversation, who has not signed the, uh, the uh, filled in the sign up sheet? Uh, Beth's going to bring them around. Again, I just really encourage you to put your name and your email on there because I'll be sending out stuff to you each week about uh, each session. So I appreciate that. And again, um, we have one packet for each household uh we'll make some packets for those of you that didn't get them today but if you when you leave today if you just take one packet for each household that way we'll make sure we have enough to go around for everybody and we'll get a few more made for next week uh, these are the questions i'd like you to be talking about and for those of you in the back if maybe you could just make a couple of circles maybe uh, four people each or however you want to uh, circle in or if you want to join at a table that's fine and we're going to take the next 10 minutes to talk about these questions. These are th three questions that I've pulled out of your book, uh, and I've kind of reworded re uh, them a little bit. Um, and if you want to just focus on one as a table, that's fine. Um, but these are three questions you can take a look at. The first one is a um, key point about how the church is a community of moral involvement. We talked about that a little bit. How is the church a community of moral involvement? The second one is, can you identify an experience of partisan polarization? Um, and, and what helps you feel heard if you're you know, talking with somebody who maybe is of another opinion? Um, and then the last one, uh, Reverend Wilbur defines politics as how we conduct government for the common good. How would you imagine society would look if there were zero politics influencing decisions? You know, if we didn't have partisan politics influencing our decisions, and it was all about the common good, what might that look like? What might our society look like if everybody was focused on the, the common good and not partisan politics. So these are some questions to get you started. Um, let's go ahead and, and talk for about the next 10 minutes and I'll put you back together for a closing. Let's see, I'll call this uh, back so, again. Thank you for the robust conversations at your table. We'll give you more time next week. Um, 
So I just wanted to make sure you had a little bit of time for conversation. I won't be uh, taking up quite so much time doing the introduction. So we'll have some, have some good conversation uh, to next week. So you can get into the topic a little bit more. Okay. So I, I'm wondering how to as a more extensive discussion of the two kingdoms, which you can and they talk about there are five ways that the two sides. Okay. Okay. So I would bring up in full to try to look this up online. I'm going to give you my email address. Right now, because I'd like you to send that to me, and I'll send it out to everybody. Okay, well, the link for it, yeah. Okay, that's what I need. That's what I need your address. Okay, I'm a French guy right here, so. Anybody else that wants it, it's yeah. R.W. Rouse at Comcast.net. It's pretty easy. My first two initials of my last name, R.W. Rouse at Comcast.net. Yeah, send that to me, and I'll send it out to everybody. Okay, the link. I can say and so I'm also going to send you the link to the actual draft statement for you to look at it, as well as other things. Uh, I wanted to commend to you there's another article in the um, packet that I printed out for you, um, in addition to the, um, and by the way, the statement about Luther's two kingdoms uh, was written by a, a friend and colleague of mine, you might know, uh, Dwayne Larson, uh, who taught um, systematic theology at Gettysburg. Uh, seminary and then as president of Wartburg Theological Seminary. Uh, I was on the board there for about 12 years when he was president. And uh, he's a brilliant theologian. And this was uh, actually, and I, um, I think I gave him, I hope I gave him credit. Okay. And then there's another article. Uh, this is by, interestingly enough, uh, Andrew Sedell, who is uh, um, a scholar and researcher who's been doing a lot of work in the area of Christian nationalism, and Representative Jared Huffman, uh, they wrote this article called Church and Separation, Church and State Separation is Broken Down Before Our Eyes. So we'll talk about this a little bit next week. So I wanted to commend that article for you to read uh, in preparation for next week. So we have a lot to probably in the next five weeks. Thank you for being here. Yeah. How many people need packets? Okay, at least three of you need the packets. Okay, we'll have some more news for you for next week. And yes, and this Parks is going to be around. He's right there. If you want to join him for a tour, he's ready to take you on a tour. Um, right now.